did the Qumran community believe that the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel was messianic or not? Did they also believe if it was already fulfilled with Antiochus Epiphanes or was it still yet future? In this video, you'll find out. Currently in our survey of interpretation of the 70 weeks prophecy is that we have covered 2nd through 4th century AD Christian views and the 2nd AD to the present rabbinic view. The historical reminder here is that the rabbinic period is categorized by being post 70 AD or 100 AD as writers such as Josephus and the New Testament writers are typically categorized as Second Temple Period writers during the time up to 100 AD. And really what Rabbinic Judaism is, is the continuation of Pharisaic Judaism from the Second Temple Period. And as you can see, there were other Jewish groups who had their own theological beliefs, and the only other Second Temple Jewish group that survived until today is the Jesus, <laughs> Jesus movement. The rabbinic view of the 70 weeks is based upon or really developed in conjunction with their very faulty chronology of history with the four Gentile empires. You will need to go back and watch that video to see how exactly they developed this chronology. The short ref refuting of the system is threefold. First is that chronologically, they cut out 166 years from the Second Temple period by largely reducing the Persian Empire period down to only 52 years. Next, historically, they don't acknowledge 13 of the kings from the Babylonian and Persian empires. That's pretty difficult when many of those deleted out in the Persian period uh, of those kings have their very own graves cut out in mountains that you can still go observe today. And lastly is that textually, they falsely accuse Daniel of not knowing how to interpret it, how to interpret Jeremiah 29:10, even though Daniel lived it out. The rabbi's false interpretation is quite evident when they say that the first seven weeks of the 70 weeks prophecy is 52 years and not 49 because they have to do this because there's a huge chronological mess that they have to overcome. So sorry to any rabbis listening out there is that you can't in one hand say that the 70 weeks is exactly 490 years from the one first temple destruction to the second temple destruction and then say the first seven weeks of uh, 52 is close enough to 49. But the craziest part in that study was that although you could see the deliberate hand of the rabbis trying to avoid the messianic interpretation, is that still within the Talmud, i.e. the oral law, is that varying rabbis were still expecting the Messiah and or messianic era to commence at the conclusion of the 70 weeks. So the 70 weeks overall is still messianic to rabbis today. The clearest statement of this is in Megillah 3a that reads, The reason why Rabbi Jonathan ben Unzil was denied permission to translate the books in the writings. Breaking in quickly is that this is in reference to the third section of the Tanakh being translated into Aramaic for Rabbi Jonathan's Targum. It continues, is because it is has in it a revelation of the end when the Messiah will arrive, as foretold in a cryptic manner in the book of Daniel. Only the 70 weeks involves a chronological descriptor and can properly account for this statement. So, when you see these modern rabbis trying to say that the 70 weeks isn't messianic, is that you have plenty of statements within the Talmud itself that refutes their claim. Now we are going to reverse the clock back prior to the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD and within the varying Jewish sects during this time 
is that today we will be looking at the Qumran community, who were very likely the Essene group that harbored the Dead Sea Scrolls. Within the vast collection is that this is the list of material that we will be drawing upon today. I selected these because of their direct involvement and tie to Daniel 9. If you know more, uh, just please drop it in the comment section below because here in this ministry, we don't want any stone left to unturn. Recall that out of the eight Book of Daniel Dead Sea Scrolls, that only one scroll contains any part of chapter nine. The third and eighth scroll here covers an overlapping range, but only scroll 4Q116 has recovered chapter nine verses with these coming from Daniel's prayer. Overall, is that currently found, the currently found Book of Daniel recovered scrolls is that they contain 49% of the book. But as you can see is that portions of chapter nine is chapter nine not contained here are contained in other manuscripts along with chapter 12 that demonstrates that the whole book was present at Qumran. And within 4Q174, is that we have a direct reference to the book of Daniel. In column one, starting on line 14, it says the following. An interpretation of blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Interpretation of the world concerns those who depart from the way. Keep in mind is that the brackets here indicate that there is a break or a gap in the scroll and that the translator of the scroll inserted what he or she likely felt the author's original wording was. Continuing on. Which is written in the book of Isaiah, the prophet, for the last days. It happened that with a strong hand he turned me aside from walking on the path of this people, and they are those about whom it is written in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet, they should not defile themselves any longer with all of their idols. Now, as you can see, is that we have direct references to the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel within these four lines. How to understand what the Qumran writer is doing here is that he is trying to give his audience an interpretation of topics and does so by citing verses from what he, and probably all of them, considered canonized scripture within the community. In Hebrew, this is known as a pesher, that is essentially a commentary on scripture. Now, if you're wondering the effect these types of scrolls have on the dating debate, is that of course they have a direct impact, but this can only be you know, really analyzed if we're discussing all the current radiocarbon dating of the eight Daniel scrolls and everything, all the other scrolls that are tied to Daniel as well. And basically, I really do hope to do that in another video, uh, but you know, at the end of the day is that it's gonna take all the combining of all of our material uh, with like a lot of these citations from other books and the Greek additions to the book itself. Uh, we know that in chapter three, there's a prayer of Azariah, a very lengthy, that's only found in the uh, Greek translation. Uh, and then you have chapters 13 and 14 of Susanna and Bell and the Dragon at the very end. And you also have uh, the Greek translations of Daniel. Uh, there's the old Greek, there's the Theodosian, and there's many others that we'll be discussing in the future. And historic references that need to also be considered uh, like from Josephus that will all together conclusively show that the critics 165, 164 date is simply not tenable. Thus, it only allows for the view that all 12 chapters were composed long before Antiochus Epiphanes and the Maccabean revolt. Now, back to 4Q174. If you were to purchase an English translation for the non-biblical Dead Sea Scrolls like Weizabeg and Cooks or Vermezes, is that they provide the verses that are cited by the Qumran writer in their translations. And now this takes us to column two in one 
our 4Q174. This is the time of the trial that comes to Judah to complete. Belial and a remnant will remain Lot and they do all the law. Moses, it is as it is written in the book of Daniel, the prophet, the wicked act wickedly and the righteous shall be made white and be purified and a people who know God will remain strong after which is for them in their descent. Line three directly references the book of Daniel and then cites Daniel 12.10 to support his thematic interpretation. This shows that the Qumran community had the entirety of the book in hand and also that they saw it as accepted scripture. Currently, this is the only example that I know of that refers to the book of Daniel in this way in the Qumran community. But, as you can see, is that Daniel is categorized with other accepted major prophets at this time. And in 1QS, typically referred to as the community rule, is that column six says that community members are to read from the book and interpret scripture together. So it gives you the sense that there's a, a, a canonization and the pulling together of the Old Testament or the Snock uh, has been completed at this point in time. So this confirms that the book of Daniel was considered canon at Qumran. Why this is so important is because it tells us that the Qumran writers were pulling from Daniel while they were composing their non-biblical scrolls and not the other way around, meaning that the book of Daniel predates all of the non-biblical scrolls at Qumran. Again, to show pre-Antiochian author authorship based upon the Dead Sea Scrolls would involve, you know, looking at all the radiocarbon dating data out there and also understand when the Qumran community was formed. But for now is that we know that the non-biblical Dead Sea Scrolls works are going to provide us with how this particular Jewish pre-Christian community interpreted the 70 weeks prophecy. Now out of our list of Qumran material is that only the Testament of Levi directly references the 70 weeks. And so we're going to start there in chapters 16 through 18 of that work. And now I have learned that for 70 weeks you shall go astray and profane the priesthood and pollute the sacrifices. And you shall make void the law and set at naught the words of the prophets by evil perverseness. And you shall persecute righteous men and hate the godly. The words of the faithful shall you abhor. And a man who reneweth the law in the power of the Most High you shall call a deceiver and at last you shall rush upon him to slay him, not knowing his dignity, taking innocent blood through wickedness upon your heads. And your holy places shall be laid waste even to the ground because of him. And you shall have no place that is clean, but you shall be among the Gentiles a curse and a dispersion until he shall again visit you and in pity shall receive you through faith and water. Now, I imagine your ears perked up quite a bit there because in 16.3, it talked about a future man that the Jews will call a deceiver and kill him, although he is innocent of blood. 16.4 sounds like the city and temple being destroyed. And now, we can easily see how these verses uh, connect to Daniel 9.24 and especially 9.26. Then take note of verse 5 again because it says that the Jews will be dispersed among the Gentiles until the man they killed returns back, i.e. a second coming. Now, if this all sounds a little too good to be true, is that it will, it very well could be. Because currently, 
There is an ongoing chicken or the egg debate between what scholars call the Aramaic Levite document and what we just read in what is called the Testament of Levi out of the Testament of the Patriarchs. Only 12, or excuse me, only two small fragments of Levi have been found at Qumran, along with one fragment of the Testament of Naphtali. So, there is a camp that sees a little too much New Testament in what we just read and in other parts of the work. Because the next thing the writer says in 17.3 is that in the second jubilee, he that is anointed shall be conceived in the sorrow of beloved ones, and his priesthood shall be honored and shall be glorified by all. Now, obviously this sounds a lot like Jesus' conception, then him being called the great high priest over the church, like in the book of Hebrews. Now, just listen to chapter 18, and just be honest with yourself by asking, does this sound a little too good to be true or not? Then shall the Lord raise up a new priest, and to him all the words of the Lord shall be revealed. And he shall execute a righteous judgment upon the earth for a multitude of days. And his star shall arise in heaven as of a king, lighting up the light of knowledge as the sun the day. And he shall be magnified in the world. He shall shine forth as the sun on the earth, and shall remove all darkness from under heaven, and there shall be peace in all the earth. The heavens shall exult in his days, and the earth shall be, glor shall be glad, and the clouds shall rejoice, and the knowledge of the Lord shall be poured forth upon the earth as the waters of the seas, and the angels of the glory of the presence of the Lord shall be glad in him. The heavens shall be open, and from the temple of glory shall come upon him sanctification, with the Father's voice as from Abraham to Isaac. And the glory of the Most High shall be uttered over him, and the spirit of understanding and sanctification shall rest upon him in the water. For he shall give the majesty of the Lord to his sons in truth forevermore. And there shall none succeed him for all generations forever. And in his priesthood, the Gentiles shall be multiplied in knowledge upon the earth and enlightened through the grace of the Lord. In his priesthood shall sin come to an end and the lawless shall cease to do evil and just shall rest in him. And he shall open the gates of the paradise and shall remove the threatening sword against Adam. And he shall give to the saints to eat from the tree of life, and the spirit of holiness shall be on him. And Beliar shall be bound by him, and he shall give power to his children to tread upon the evil spirits. And the Lord shall rejoice in his children and be pleased in his beloved ones forever. Then shall Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob exalt and I will be glad, and all the saints shall clothe themselves with joy. Then now, my children, you have heard all. Choose therefore for yourselves either the light or the darkness, either the law of the Lord or the works of Beliar. Now, I think when you pull out all the bullet points of chapter 18, is that you basically see Jesus' whole life retold. You have the star of Bethlehem, uh, his baptism by John the Baptist, growth of followers, especially Gentiles, forgiveness of sins by the cross, revelation themes of eating from the tree of life and the, uh, Satan being bound, and his followers having power over evil spirits. It just seems to be a little too exact. <laughs> and if we were to go back to chapter 14 in verses, four, uh, verses 1 through 2, is that we see a little bit more of this. Therefore, my children, I have learned that at the end of the ages you shall transgress against the Lord, stretching out hands to wickedness against him, and to all the Gentiles shall you become a scorn. 
For our father Israel is, poor, is pure from the transgressions of the chief priests who shall lay their hands upon the Savior of the world. Now, there are many scholars who, you know, have commented on this very apparent match with the life of Jesus. Um, and here's Martin McNair's take. Certain sections of the Testaments uh, seem closely related to the New Testament and in some texts, at least in them, are of Christian origin. But there are also re resemblances with the literature of Qumran. For over a century, it has been a matter of discussion among scholars whether the Testaments is basically a Jewish work with Christian interpolations or a Christian composition which uses Jewish sources. Opinion is still divided on the origins of the present Testaments. Some believe that the work was composed by a Jew or Jewish Christian in the first or second century AD. Others maintain that they are of pre-Christian or Jewish, poss possibly a seen origin. The original language of the present work, whether Aramaic or Greek, is also debated. So, I'm sorry if this seemed like a little bit like, you know, a bait and switch to you, but I would say it's more like a, a bait and wait uh, because the manuscript evidence is just not conclusive enough to say for us to like, yup, boom, we got it. Um, and that's, but that really goes for either side in this. So, uh, really, why did I even bring that up? Well, because you will come across Christian scholars uh, who will point to chapter 16 and say, yes, look, there's strong evidence for a pre-Christian, you know, for, um, you know, the messianic interpretation and more or less forecasting Jesus' life. Uh, when, when you really look at it a whole is that you can see yeah, it's just, it seems too good to be true. <laughs> uh, and they'll do this without bringing up what you know, appears to be post-70 AD, you know, Christian's hand at work in here. And uh, I personally would rather show you the whole picture uh, versus, you know, being accused of confirmation bias. But if there ends up being scrolls found in Qumran that have all this, then oh boy. So basically, I'm going to have to piecemeal the Qumran's community's interpretation together from the other listed scrolls, starting with the Book of Jubilees. This book provides us with how to calculate the, the length of the 70 weeks according to the Essenes. Jubilees 23.8 is a great example of how the writer dated events and lifespans throughout the book. And as you can see is that they uh, list spans in terms of Jubilees, weeks of years, and in years. According to the writer, each jubilee contained 49 years, so three totaled 147 years. Then four weeks of years would be 28 years, totaling altogether 175 for the life of Abraham here. This does match what is listed in Genesis 25.7, as well when it describes Abraham's length of life. What you're seeing here with the Jubilee writer is an expansion on the detail written down by Moses, and he, the Jubilee's writer, does this throughout the book. As you can see here in Jubilees 419, when it describes the year in which Cain had his son Enoch and when he started to build uh, the city. These dates are not given to us by Moses in Genesis 4.17. There uh, is a cal calendrical reason why the Jubilees writer is doing this and also why he's referring to these all in periods of Jubilees. It is something that you know we're going to discuss more uh, later on in the vi video. And just in case you were kind of lost right now on just what is a Jubilee, is that it's spelt out in Leviticus 25, 8 through 17. And I'll just read a couple of verses uh, from that section. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of the years shall be unto thee forty-nine years. 
and you shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. And you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. In the year of this jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. It's a little repeated there, but this type of language is why they call a jubilee, a jubilee year the year of release. Visually, this is how a jubilee cycle would look according to the Qumran community. Now, modern day rabbis will disagree with this and say that the next jubilee cycle does not start until the 51st year and not on the 50th year. Maimonides, aka Rambam, dives into this quite a bit in his work, but we can rewind the clock even more to the 2nd and 3rd century ADs within the Talmud and see that there is still a disagreement among rabbinic Jews on this topic. In Rosh Hashanah 9a, it says the following, And the rabbis, who do, who do not require an additional verse to derive that the Jubilee year does not extend until Yom Kippur of the 51st year, derive the, of this hakala from the verse, you count the 50th year as the jubilee, jubilee year alone, but you do not count the 50th year as the Jubilee year and also as the first year of the next sabbatical cycle. This Hakala comes to exclude the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, who said that the 50th year is counted for here and for there, both as a Jubilee year and also as the first year of the next sabbatical cycle. Lest someone think that, there, that that is the case, therefore, the verse teaches us that this is not so. Rather, the 50th year is the Jubilee year, and the following year is the first year of the next sabbatical cycle. So, you can see there was a differing of opinion, even within the rabbinic community, after 70 AD, very early on. But for the Qumran community, is that the 50th year started the next cycle, as seen in Jubilees 419. Altogether, the Book of Jubilees describes events from Genesis 1 through Exodus 12, and in their calculation, totals 2,400, oops, sorry, totals 2,410 years. And once you add the 40 years uh, in the wilderness wandering, is that this actually comes to a perfect 50 Jubilees in a 49 year cycle system. So, they would call this a Jubilee of Jubilees. This is intentional by them because it just doesn't match what Moses wrote. There is, at minimum, a hundred years difference even if you go with the shorter sojourning period in Egypt. Regardless, is that what we are seeing is that the Qumran community interpret the weeks of years as a seven-year period. That's the important piece for us. And in 1QS, i.e. the community rule, scroll, community rule scroll, we, the weeks of years and jubilee periods describe, are described again. And in the Apocryphon of Jeremiah, it says the following. But I will not seek them on account of their unfaithfulness, by which they were unfaithful to me, until the completion of ten jubilee of years. Ten times forty-nine is four hundred and ninety years. So, we see a clear allusion to Daniel's seventy weeks here. The writer continues, saying, In those days there will be a king, and he will be a reviler, and he will perform abominations. But I will tear away his kingship, and that king will be destined for kings. This language mirrors the description found in Daniel 9.27's 70th week. This is, all, is confirmed as the Apocryphon writer says, And the dominion of Belial will be on them to hand them over to the sword for 
a week of years. And in that jubilee, they will break all my precepts and all my commandments, which I have commanded them by the hand of my servants, the prophets. We see, and continuing on, and they will start to contend with one another for 70 years from the day of breaking the law and the covenant, which they will break. This one week of years, uh, persecution period, is clearly tied to Daniel 9.27. And earlier in the Apocryphon, it said the following, And they will also do what is evil in my eyes, just as everything the Israelites did in the earlier days of their kingship apart from those who returned first from the land of their captivity to build the sanctuary. And I will speak to them and send to them in a commandment, and they will understand all that they have forsaken, they and their fathers. This mirrors 925's statement that the 70 weeks clock started with the going forth of the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem after they had returned back from exile. So, currently, we are able to know a few things about how the Qumran community interpreted the 70 weeks. And here is a cleaner view viewing of this uh, going verse by verse. Then, if we wanted to chart this out, is that we have the following. Now, one reply to this might be that in the book of Enoch, there is an eschatological prophecy called the Apocalypse of Weeks. And just for knowledge's sake, is that here are the current scrolls found in Qumran for the book of Enoch. 4Q2.12 contains the Apocalypse of Weeks, prophecy that is found in the last section of the book in chapters 93 and 91. Yes, I intentionally listed that backwards, as weeks 1 through 7 are in chapter 93, and weeks 8 through 10 are after in chapter 91. Altogether, the author describes events from creation to eternity in 10 symbolic weeks. Why this prophecy likely is alluding to, or at minimum, playing off of the 70 weeks prophecy is that in Enoch 91.15, it describes events taking place in the seventh part of the tenth week. So, it's likely that the writer envisioned 70 parts to his ten weeks to make the readers kind of think of, oh yeah, Daniel's 70 weeks. We'll quickly go through Enoch's Apocalypse of Weeks, uh, just so you know what it's all about starting in 93.1. And after that, Enoch both gave and began to recount from the books. And Enoch said, Concerning the children of righteousness and concerning the elect of the world and concerning the plant of unrighteousness, I will speak these things. Yes, I, Enoch, will declare them unto you, my sons. According to that which appeared to me in the heavenly vision, and which I have known through the word of the holy angels, and have learnt from the heavenly tablets. And Enoch began to recount from the books, and said, I was born the seventh in the first week, while judgment and righteousness still endured. So, week one covers from creation to Enoch. And after me there shall arise in the second week great wickedness, and deceit shall have sprung up, and in it there shall be the first end. And in it a man shall be saved, and after it is ended, unrighteousness shall grow up, and a law shall be made for the sinners. So, week two covers from Enoch to the flood. And after that, in the third week, at its close, a man shall be elected as the plant of righteous judgment, and his posterity shall become the plant of righteousness forevermore. 
So you can hear week three uh, describing Abraham and Israel being created. And after that, in the fourth week, at its close, visions of the holy and the righteous shall be seen, and a law for all generations and an enclosure shall be made for them. Here you should be thinking Mount Sinai and the giving of the law to Moses. And after that, in the fifth week, at its close, the house of glory and dominion shall be built forever. Here it describes the Davidic dynasty and the first temple being constructed. And after that, in the sixth week, all who live in it shall be blinded, and the hearts of all of them shall godliness, or godlessness forsake wisdom. And in it a man shall ascend, and at its close the house of dominion shall be burnt with fire, and the whole race of the chosen root shall be dispersed. This should be an easy one uh, to recognize as it's describing Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of Jerusalem and the first temple and his deportation of Israelites back to Babylon. And after that, in the seventh week, shall an apostate generation arise, and many shall be its deeds, and all its deeds shall be apostate. And at its close shall be elected the elect righteous of the eternal plant of righteousness to receive sevenfold instruction concerning all his creation. Now, since this week would represent the post-exilic period, is that the apostate generation is likely talking about the Jewish leadership that led many into idolatry at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Now, chapter 91, going back two chapters, continues from the seventh week into the eighth week for us. And it says, And after that the roots of unrighteousness shall be cut off, and the sinners shall be destroyed by the sword, shall be cut off from the blasphemers in every place, and those who plan violence and those who commit blasphemy shall perish by the sword. And after that there shall be another, the eighth week, that of righteousness, and a sword shall be given to it, that a righteous judgment may be executed on the oppressors, and the sinners shall be delivered into the hands of the righteous. And at its close they shall acquire houses through their righteousness, and a house shall be built for the great king in glory forevermore. So, we are starting to hear about a future period of righteousness with a new temple being built likely for the Messiah from the term that was used here, the for the great king. And after that, in the ninth week, the righteous judgment shall be revealed to the whole world, and all the works of the godless shall vanish from all the earth, and the world shall be written down for destruction, and all mankind shall look to the path of uprightness. Here, Week 9 described a period of judgment for the godless. And after this, in the tenth week, in the seventh part, there shall be the great eternal judgment, in which he will execute vengeance among, amongst the angels. Here, Week 10 describes the judgment that will come upon the fallen angels who rebelled and procreated with women in the pre-flood world as described in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. But if you just kind of saw there about the whole, the seventh part in the 10th week, well, if it's seven sevens make a jubilee, then the last seven would be a what? A seven year period. So it would be the last week, if you will, in that. So you, you kind of get Daniel 9, 27 in that seventh part of the 10th week. Uh, it's an illusion, it's, you know, but you can kind of see how they're doing with it. And the first heaven shall depart and pass away, and a new heaven shall appear, and all the powers of heavens shall give sevenfold light. Here the writer is pulling from the very end of the book of Isaiah that describes the new heaven and new earth ushered in by the Lord. And then after this, the Enochian writer says, And after that there will be many weeks without number forever, and all shall be in the goodness and righteousness, and sin 
shall no more be mentioned forever. The many weeks here is clearly representing eternity in the new heavens and earth. So, altogether we have the ten Enochian weeks described here. Again, I think the fact that the writer envisioned 70 parts shows that he had Daniel's 70 weeks in mind and that he repurposed it in a different way to fit the narrative of his book. So, our Qumran system of exactly 490 years, starting at the end of the exile, is still intact. There's three things in the Book of Enoch that help us understand how the Qumran community interpreted Daniel's prophecies, and in particular the 70 weeks. First is a reminder from our Daniel 7 study that we showed that in Enoch, the Book of Enoch, that we see the Son of Man figure described being present with the head of days, i.e. the ancient of days, before creation. The Enochian writer continues to say that, and he, the Son of Man, shall be the light of the Gentiles. And on the day of their affliction there shall be rest on the earth, and before them they shall fall and not rise again. And there shall be no one to take them from his hands and raise them, for they have denied the Lord of spirits and his anointed. Now, I think it's more likely that this reference to the Mashiach, the his anointed, is pulling from Psalm 2 and not from Daniel 9. But it is still dealing with the Messiah, and it connects back to the Son of Man figure that we just saw described. Next is that we see Daniel 2's medals quite clearly being used in chapter 52 of Enoch, but in this case, the four main medals are reversed in order. The mountain language here is in reference to governments. Uh, you see mountain language being referred to governments all over the New Testament. Comparatively, is that you can see that the Enochian writer reverses the order, and also that he took the iron mixed with clay and split it into two mountains, and two governments, of a soft metal and one of lead. Chapter 52 continues saying that these governments will melt away and become powerless before the elect one, i.e. the Mashiach, the Son of Man figure. Now, there's a lot more that I could show in this section of Enoch that is primarily uh, known as the Book of Parables, but once again, I need to be transparent and honest with you is that the fact is, is that within the current Enoch scrolls found at Qumran, is that none of them contain any part of the book of parables. And as you can see is that both 4Q 204 and 206 contain sections on both sides of the book of parables. And the thing to note here is that the book of parables is not found within any of the Greek manuscripts of Enoch either. So, this isn't necessarily a simple argument from silence by critics, and why some scholars will even date the Book of Parables as late as 270 AD, and advocate that a Jewish Christian writer interpolated it, interpolated it <laughs> uh, is that the earliest form of the whole book that we have today uh, comes from uh, the Ethiopic version in the 11th century. So, we aren't necessarily free to add uh, on these descriptions of Daniel 2 and 7 uh, from the Book of Parables section into our system that we're developing for Qumran. So, my first two points are kind of stuck in limbo, if you will, uh, until earlier manuscripts are found. But my third point is something that we can use to develop our understanding of how they thought about Daniel 70 weeks. And this point is a calendrical one, uh, and that is found within the astronomical book section as it describes a very unique calendar that only the Qumran community was using at this time, and that is a 364-day solar calendar. Now, 
since there's 11 chapters in Enoch devoted to this topic, is that we do need to park on this for a little bit, as it does come up in a lot in academic discussions on how to potentially make sense out of the 1,290 and 1,335 days that are referenced in Daniel at the very end in chapter 12. So let's read some selected passages to understand how they made sense of a 364-day solar calendar. 70, or 74, 12. And the sun and the stars bring in all the years exactly so that they do not advance or delay their position by a single day unto eternity, but complete the years with perfect justice in 364 days. The main thing here is that the writer is claiming that this is a perfect calendar and needs no intercalation, i.e. inserting of days, weeks, or months uh, periodically like we do uh, you know, every four years uh, in February. In their mind, this is God's eternal calendar. And they double down on this by giving us three examples of the totals of days over a three, five, and eight year period. And in the next verse, uh, in, in this next verse, and all of these uh, are 364 day years when you divide them out. This is taking basically a pot shot at the lunar solar system that basically most Jews were using at this time back in Jerusalem, where there was at least two, if not three, intercalations of an extra month over a seven-year period. So, you know, when they give that, you know, two, uh, three, five, and eight-year period, it's just like, hey, look, even over a whole Sabbath of years, we don't do any intercalation. The, the writer explains this calendar more by saying, and the year is accurately completed in conformity with their world stations and the stations of the sun, which rise from the portals through which it, the sun, rises and sets 30 days. The portals of the sun here is describing the sun as it appears to travel along the ecliptic and passes through the 12 zodiacal constellations in the night sky each year. This is most clearly described in 75.4 with the description of 12 doors with the sun charioting in heaven going through each of them. So this gives us 360 days currently. The remaining four days uh, were described in th three verses before this that say, And the leaders of the heads of the thousands who are placed over the whole creation and over all the stars have also to do with the four intercalary days. So, four additional days are inserted in on the annual calendar. 84 two, or 82.4 describes how the four, di four divide the four portions of the year. So, the Enochian calendar can be di diagrammed out in the following manner, with the spring being the start of the new year, and as you likely assume from the description, is that the four intercalary days are the annual e equinoxes and solstices. Thus, each portion of the year is composed of 13 weeks of 91 days that altogether is 52 weeks, equating to 364 days. Now, I'm sure the most obvious thought coming through your head is that well, that's still not a true solar year. It's still off by, you know, 1.25 days uh, on average. Yes, but basically the Qumran community didn't care. <laughs> and truth be told is that scholarship has no clue on how the community handled this glaring issue because Passover had to be kept in the spring because many rituals like waving of the sheaf offering had to be done in the spring, and other agricultural offerings were also aligned to the other feasts as well. How they dealt with that, again, is, a, is another issue that nobody in the academic community knows anything for sure on. So, just in case you read or watch something that says that this calendar is perfect and should be the one that we follow today, is that it's not. <laughs> There are astronomical 
and biblical problems with it. Nonetheless, uh, this is the writer of Enoch's so-called perfect solar calendar. Now, we do learn a little bit, a bit of why they adopted this calendar as one of its goals was to keep the festivals falling on the exact same day each year, meaning that Passover would always occur on the second Tuesday of the first month on the 14th day. There's no deviation in any of this. Now, don't get confused by looking at the chart here and by thinking that, are they making Tuesday, or excuse, yeah, Tuesday be the seventh day of the week, i.e. the Sabbath day? No. What they're doing is making the first day of the first month, the new year, to always start on Wednesday, the fourth day of the week. Because on the fourth day of creation week is that God created the sun and said that it is to be used for calendrical purposes. Now, I get, if, I get it if you're like, yeah, but God created the moon too that day with the same described purpose. I get it, but just, you know, just wash that away in your head and just keep rolling with what they're thinking here. And we see more descriptions of this as the Jubilees writer uh, expanded on uh, day four verse by saying that, and God appointed the sun to be a great sign on the earth for days and for Sabbaths and for months and for feasts and for years and for Sabbaths of years and for jubilees and for all seasons of the years. This is quite clearly saying that only the sun is to be our guide in the calendar. Just forget about the moon and uh, how it was always used for basically all the centuries in Jewish thinking that, uh, that determined a new month. Uh, with the appearance of a new crescent moon uh, appearing. The Qumran community didn't care. Uh, in a little bit, we're going to see why they didn't care about it. Now, this obviously begs the question, if the Jubilees writer had the same Enochian calendar uh, going on in his head? And the answer is yes. Jubilees 29.16 quite clearly alludes to the four intercalary days occurring at the annual e equinoxes and solstices. Jubilees 629 describes each portion of the year having 13 weeks, totaling 52 weeks of year of days, and the Jubilees writer says, and there is no neglect neglecting this commandment for a single year or from year to year. And command thou the children of Israel that they observe the years according to this reckoning, 364 days, and these will constitute a complete year. So, there's the explicit statement that a 364 solar day year is to be used year in and year out. Now, the Qumran community knew about the lunar year and its difference with this calendar, but regardless, the Jubilees writer says the following, And they will not disturb its time from its days and from its feasts, for everything will fall out in them according to their testimony, and they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feast. But if they do not neglect and do not observe them according to his commandment, then they will disturb all their seasons and the years will be dislodged from this order. And they will disturb the seasons and the years will be dislodged and they will neglect their ordinances. And all the children of Israel will forget and will not find the path of the years and will forget the new moons and seasons and Sabbaths, and they will go wrong as to all the order of the years. For I know, and from henceforth will I declare it unto thee, and it is not of my own devising, for the book lies written before me, and on the heavenly tablets the division of the days is ordained lest they forget the Feast of the Covenant and walk according to the Feast of the Gentiles after their error and after their ignorance. There's the big issue for them. The Qumran community was so disgusted by the pagans and saw that by using the same calendar as them, that eventually their feast to Yahweh would fall on the same days and potentially cause Jews, or same days as pagan festivals, 
and potentially cause Jews to celebrate both or become apostate, like recently we, uh, you read in, uh, during the Maccabean period uh, under Antiochus. He, the Jubilees writer, continues to say that, For there will be those who will assuredly make observations of the moon, how it disturbs the seasons and comes in from year to year ten days too soon. This shows that they knew their Jewish contemporaries were using a lunar solar calendar with the annual feast falling on different days of the week. For this reason, the years will come upon them when they will disturb the order and make an abominable day the day of testimony and an unclean day a feast day. And they will confound all the days, the holy with the unclean and the unclean day with the holy. For they will go wrong as to the months and Sabbaths and feasts and jubilees. For this reason, I command and testify to thee that thou mayest testify to them. For after thy death, thy children will disturb them, so that they will not make the year 364 days only. And for this reason, they will go wrong as to the new moons and seasons and Sabbaths and festivals, and they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh. So, we know that the Qumran community was using this 364-day solar calendar as we find it in both books of Enoch and Jubilees. What's interesting is that there are scrolls that contain fragments in the Qumran community that are actually trying to sync the lunar and solar calendars together. But, they are too fragmented to make any broad conclusions on how they might have synced up the calendars year in and year out. And as said earlier, is that this 364 day calendar causes you know, annual drifting that would eventually have the Passover and other festivals falling back with like Passover happening in the winter. Another issue though for the Qumran community was that all male Jews were obligated to come to Jerusalem for the three main festivals, of which are the unleavened bread, the harvest, and the ingathering, all of which were tied to agricultural seasons. What's interesting is Josephus says that the Essenes were prohibited from coming to the temple court. A quick sidebar here from this statement is that this is one of the reasons why an overwhelming majority of scholars do not categorize John the Baptist, Jesus, and his followers as Essenes. Jesus, John, and all his disciples, they attended all the festivals in Jerusalem that the Sanhedrin, who were made up of Pharisees and Sadducees, annually put together. Now, outside of Enoch and Jubilees, is that we do get allusions to this calendar in other Dead Sea Scrolls. In 1QS, we see the reference to the appointed times and that they are not to deviate in the smallest detail from any of God's words as these apply to their own time. They are neither to advance their holy times nor to postpone any of their prescribed festivals. This is quite similar to what we just read in Jubilees. Now, with the barring from the temple in Jerusalem and the ever-drifting issue was that you kind of get the sense that the Qumran community knew that these were big issues for them. But nonetheless was that they were an apocalyptic community that they felt that God was very soon going to set everything right again and that as the sons of light, they had the true calendar in their hands and the rest of Israel was an heir. So in their minds, it was better to stay away from Jerusalem, don't use that calendar, and just practice, if you will, out in the desert how it should actually be going. And eventually, in one day, in short time in their thinking, is that God is going to put it all back in order and they're going to get rewarded for their obedience. The wording of this kind of thinking is found here in the is found in the Damascus document and that we can get this when it does refer to 364 day calendar 
And as later in the document, it directly refers to the Book of Jubilees as the Book of Divisions and Seasons. Now, there is one more thing that needs to be brought up about the four intercalary days. And that is whether or not the Qumran community actually counted them in the year. And I know that just kind of like, what do you mean? They, they didn't count them? What? <laughs> yes, I get it. Uh, but the thing is, is that 7412 said that a per, even though it said uh, that a perfect year is 364 days, thus, you know, it looks like they did count them in, is that right before this in, 11, in verse 11, it says the following. And the overplus of the sun and of the stars amounts to six days. In five years, six days every year comes to 30 days. And the moon falls behind the sun and the stars to a number of 30 days. Now, the only way that you can make that statement is if you get six, if you get six more days is that you're only working with 30-day months. And you're excluding the four hundred calorie days in your calculation. Yet, verse 12 says that there is 364 days in a year. And at the very end of the astronomical book in Enoch, in chapter 82, it says that the four intercalary days are said to be counted in. As 82.6 says that, for they belong to the reckoning of the year and are truly rec recorded thereon forever. And the year is completed in 364 days. So why did I bring up this, what appears to look like a discrepancy uh, within the text? Well, because it is there. Um, and since it is, is that it gets scholars kind of thinking uh, like Boccaccini, he's probably the most well known in this, uh, and others kind of proposing different means to how we could maybe get Daniel 12's numbers. Boccaccini's is a good work. Uh, I, I enjoyed the read, but it's also expensive because it's produced by Brill. Uh, his view is that both Daniel and Enoch used the same solar calendar and that its final, um, from, uh, final form was calculated as 360 plus 4 calendar because of the description in 7411. So basically it's still 364, but it, there's kind of like this division, you know, where it, it, you don't necessarily count them, but they're there, but they're not. Yeah, you know, it's kind of a weird thing. So he, Boccaccini, contends that Daniel had only the 360 uh, portion in his mind when writing out chapter 12 as they are equal to three and a half years plus one month with uh, the second number being an additional 45 days or you could say one and a half months more than 1290 which is connected to the three and a half year period uh, as described as time times and half a time now Boccaccini is a late dater of Daniel and sees all this ending with Antiochus. But his thought experiment is worth thinking about because John's three and a half year period is stated as 1,260 days and 42 months by clearly using a 360 uh, day figure as his year length. Now, I'm not gonna go veering off here because it's just gonna get us way too ahead of ourselves. But uh, we'll come back to Boccaccini's work um, more when we get to chapter 12. Now, the final note <laughs> on this 360-day calendar potential is that the flood timeline in Genesis 7 and 8 says that the waters prevailed for 150 days from the 17th of the second month to the 17th of the seventh month. So... This span of time is exactly five months of 30 days each. In a lunar solar calendar is that you cannot find a five month span that has 30 days in them consecutively. So you can make a scriptural case for a 360 day calendar. So far, we have gleaned out some really good information from the Qumran community. 
the current chart can and should take into account their 364 day calendar. And out of the four Daniel verses is that we are only missing the Essenes take on the six objectives, their interpretation of the Mashiach terms, and the city and temple being destroyed. For the six objectives is that I can only find one spot where I believed, or you could say with really good confidence that the Qumran writer was thinking about these six objectives. And that one is found in the Damascus document. It says that, and this is the exposition of the regulations by which they shall be governed until the appearance of the Messiah of Aaron and of Israel so that their iniquity may be atoned for. Now, I'm sure your ears perked up there because first you have the language about the iniquity being atoned that matches up with the third objective really well. But I'm sure the until the appearing of the Messiah of Aaron and of Israel certainly grabbed your attention. The thing to note here is that this is actually talking about two messiahs. This language is found a lot in the Damascus document. So maybe they're thinking in the Qumran uh, community uh, is that they saw two messiahs in the 70 weeks prophecy, but still neither of them had arrived, oops, sorry, had arrived yet in their view. Now, if you're a little confused about how do you actually get two Jewish messiahs, is that in this kind of line of thinking, because they said, you know, the Messiah of Aaron and of Israel, is that they could have thought that one was from the line of Judah from and slash David, and also from the tribe of Levi, as Moses said, a prophet one day will come like unto him to the community. And since he was from the tribe of Levi, that's the connection to Aaron. I'm not going to go park on this for a, a while or anything, but this idea of two messiahs is not isolated only to the Qumran community, as this idea of there being potentially two messiahs can actually be read about uh, if you were to type in Messiah ben Joseph into, the, into a search bar, is that you'll see a lot of uh, this kind of language and, and articles brought up uh, on the rabbinic side. And still today is that there are many that do teach that there are two Jewish messiahs. Uh, one will be referred to as Mashiach ben David, uh, the son of David, is, and they'll say that he is the conquering king. And the other one is Mashiach ben Joseph. And his role is the suffering, dying, and yes, rising one. Yes, rabbis do teach about a dying and rising messiah. Um, but that's for another video. Now, it would be too easy, though, here for a critic to dismiss my interpretation and say that Daniel's Mashiachs are not what the Qumran writer was thinking about here in the Damascus document. Okay, so be it. And that is why I've been saving 11Q13, that is also known as 11Q Melchizedek, for the very end. Now, Here's my trigger alert to critics out there, is that this is going to sound very, what's the best word to call it, Christian. <laughs> and yes, scholarship does date the composition 100 years before Jesus. So there's no trying to say that some Christian redactor came along and, you know, after the cross and just kind of puffed it together like we kind of read in the Testament of Levi. And We'll use Vermez's translation uh, because, well, it's free and you can see it online uh, on that Wikipedia page that I just loaded up. So you can go check my work. So, all right, here we go. And concerning that which he said, in this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his property. And likewise, and in this is the manner of release, every creditor shall release that which he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact of his neighbor and his brother, for God's release has been proclaimed. And it will be proclaimed at the end of days concerning the captives, as he said 
to proclaim liberty to the captives. Its interpretation is that he will assign them to the sons of heaven and to the inheritance of Melchizedek, for he will cast their lot amid the portions of Melchizedek. Now, just to break in here for a moment, is that the Qumran community, in their eyes, are the sons of heaven, and the Melchizedek figure is the messianic deliverer. Continuing on. Melchizedek, who will return them there and will proclaim to them liberty, forgiving them the wrongdoings of all their iniquities. Now, I don't think I need to comment a whole lot on that section uh, because it's pretty clear cut. Continue it on. And this thing will occur in the first week of the Jubilee that follows nine Jubilees. Right there, we have a reference to 490 years as the writer is expecting Melchizedek to begin his work in the 10th Jubilee. This wording matches that of the Book of Jubilees, but more importantly, matches the Apocryphon of Jeremiah with its mentioning of 490 years in 10 Jubilee periods. This clearly has the writer thinking of Daniel 70 weeks. And let's continue on. And the Day of Atonement is the end of the 10th Jubilee, when all the sons of light and the men of the lot of Melchizedek will be atoned for. And a statute concerns them to provide them with their rewards, for this is the moment of the year of grace for Melchizedek. Now, breaking in for a moment is because what you just heard is that you got to be thinking about all the things that we have just read in this uh, document about Melchizedek, the Messiah to the Qumran community. Again, this is all coming 100 years before. You have him proclaiming liberty, forgiving iniquities, sin, <laughs> and that he's going to atone for others. Continuing on. And he, Melchizedek, will by his strength judge the holy ones of God, executing judgment as it is written concerning him in the songs of David, who said, Elohim has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And it was concerning him that he said, let the assembly of the peoples return to the height above them. El, God, will judge the peoples. As for that which he said, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Its interpretation, that of Psalm 82, concerns Belial and the spirits of his lot who rebelled by turning away from the precepts of God to, and Melchizedek will avenge the vengeance of the judgments of God. And he will drag them from the hand of Belial and from the hands of all the spirits of his lot. And all the gods of justice will come to his aid to attend to the destruction of Belial. And the height is all the sons of God this. I know there's a lot of break in there, but just wanted to read it all. <laughs> and we're going to stop there for a moment because there again, there was some really interesting stuff that we just read. We saw the Qumran writer place the Messiah as the lead judge in Psalm 82, judging the holy ones of God, who are clearly referred to here and interpreted as heavenly beings. Then says that the interpretation of Psalm 82 is about Belial and the spirits that followed him. Thus, the gods in Psalm 82 are heavenly beings that rebelled, not human judges like you might hear from some commentators. Belial is a common term in, that is used in the Dead Sea Scrolls for the divine rebel that you know, we would typically refer to as Satan. 2 Corinthians 6.15 is the only place in the New Testament that uses this term. But from Paul's references to Satan elsewhere in the letter is that we know that he has Satan in mind here as well. 
back to 11Q13. The writer says that Melchizedek will have good heavenly angels come and fight with him against Belial and his angels. Now, I'm sure Jesus coming with thousands of angels at the last days should sound very familiar to you. Now, there's one more thing that I do want to show from this section that we just read, but I'm going to save it for the very end. And for now, uh, we're just going to keep adding all these little tidbits onto the writer's messianic profile. Continuing on. This is the day of peace slash salvation, concerning which God spoke through Isaiah the prophet, who said, How beautiful upon the mountains are the, of the, are the feet of the messenger who proclaims peace, who brings good news, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, Your Elohim reigns. Its interpretation is, The mountains are the prophets, and the messenger is the anointed one of the Spirit, concerning whom Daniel said, until an anointed one, a prince. Obviously, we need to pause here, because one of Daniel 9's Mashiachs just got referenced to us by the Essene writer. Now, it needs to be acknowledged that until an anointed one, a prince, from 925, is Vermez's estimation on what the original what the writer originally had written down for Weisebeg and Cook is that they chose to fill the gap with 926 use but either way the Qumran writer clearly is saying that Daniel 9's Mashiach is the promised Messiah now did they see two or one here as you know two you know like we just saw now, we don't know but that doesn't matter because they are saying Melchizedek is the Messiah and Daniel 9 is about him. Again, this is a hundred years before Jesus coming from a Jewish community. Now, for many of you probably listening, you got to be dancing on the inside. But it actually even gets better. Continuing on. And he who brings good news, who proclaims salvation, it is concerning him that it is written to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion. To comfort those who mourn, its interpretation. To make them understand all the ages of time. In truth, will turn away from Belial by the judgments of God, as it is written concerning him, who says to Zion, your Elohim reigns. Zion is those who uphold the covenant, who turn from walking in the way of the people. And your Elohim is Melchizedek, who will save them from the hand of Belial. Boom! Did you catch what they just said there? The writer just said that Melchizedek, Melchizedek is the Messiah, is God. Oh, and oh yes, this is referencing big G God, not little G gods as other Elohim can, refer, can be referred to as, as we've seen in Psalm 82. And the writer here too is referring to the big eternal Elohim that is seated in the divine council, as this is qualifying who the writer saw Melchizedek as right from the beginning. And the writer was sure that his readers knew that he was referring to Big G God, as he sandwiched Psalm 7 right in between his verse 1 and 2 of Psalm 82 reference. And in Psalm 7, El is the one who judges the people. And in the rest of the psalm, he is referred to as Yahweh. So, this psalm, Psalm 7, 
is David asking God to rise up and judge, which the Melchizedek writer, the Qumran writer, took and applied to Melchizedek, i.e. the Messiah. This conclusively shows that the Jewish community at Qumran saw the Messiah as God and Daniel's 70 weeks as messianic. And this shows that the Qumran community did believe in a Godhead, as Melchizedek here is being pulled from Psalm 110, where David is said that he saw the Lord saying to his Lord to sit at the first Lord's right hand. This clearly has the Qumran community seen divine plurality as its theological worldview. So, in their view, they are seeing the divine Melchizedek coming at the end of the 70 weeks to save the sons of heaven and defeat Belial, Satan, and his followers. Now, before planting this onto the chart, is that there is one more line uh, in 11Q13 that let's just read qu through quickly. As for that which he said, then you shall send abroad the trumpet in all the land. This is coming from Leviticus 25.9 and describes what Israel was supposed to do on the Day of Atonement to announce that the Jubilee year, the year of release, has started. So, you can see how the Qumran writer took all that prior language and tied it to this event, the Day of Atonement, and just to sound like a broken record here again, is that overall, this does prove that Jews, or at least the sect of Jews at this point in our study, viewed the 70 weeks as messianic and that the Messiah was God himself to come in human form. So, to any non-believing Jew listening out there, I truly hope that you can see that these guys are not going or have given you the full picture. Now, for the late daters of Daniel listening in, every critic pretty much places the final composition or redaction shortly after the cleansing of the temple in 164 BC because after that event is that in Daniel 1140 through the end of the book in 1213 is that it doesn't match any of the history of that time and it just doesn't get tied to Antiochus in any way. So critics will say, oh, we'll see, this is where he started to err, so that's, that's our date, you know, because he got it all wrong, it's post-venom. So in this narrative, the critics' narrative, the book became an instant hit and became canon instantly and was seen on the same level as Isaiah, Ezekiel, and all the other prophets, just poof, overnight. So chronologically, Here's your timeline if you're a late dater, with Daniel being composed or finalized in 164 BC. The reason why instant canonization is the view is because of the sects of Judaism that accepted the book as and separated from one another during this time. And basically, you know, right after Antiochus' reign and his death is but this is when most will say they all started to fragment from each other. So, since the Essenes at Qumran rejected the priesthood in Jerusalem, is that they would not have accepted the book of Daniel as canon if it was written by a Pharisee or a Sadducee after they had already split away from them. They're not going to accept their works. Now, I'm going to keep pressing that issue going forward in our study because when we do dump all this stuff together, the writings, the manuscripts, the translations into Greek, the Greek editions, and just yada, 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 is that the critics' view on authorship and canonization of Daniel is just simply not tenable. It just does not work. 
But for this video's purpose is that we know that 11Q Melchizedek is dated around 100 BC. Okay, so just kind of follow it from here now. Another historical layer to this in this timeline is that the Hasmonean dynasty uh, that lasted from basically 140 to 37 BC. The 140 BC date is established in 1 Maccabees 1510 and in chapter 16's references. Verse 17 says, The Jews' ambassadors came to us as friends and allies to renew the old friendship and confederacy being sent from Simon the high priest and from the people of the Jews. Now, what this is saying is that Simon the high priest, basically around 141, 140 BC, asked the Romans for support and protection against the Seleucids, to which the Romans said, said yep, we'll back you. And the point here with that is that although we typically put the transition of the Greek Empire to the Roman Empire in 63 BC under Pompey, is that a more accurate timeline should re reflect this four sub-kingdoms of the Greeks and uh, the eventual of Rome's conquest of each of them in separate phases. So incorporating those dates in into our timeline is that this is how it would look in an accurate view. What I'm trying to drive here is that if you were to ask uh, a person uh, or the writer of 11Q Melchizedek writing at the, at the time of 100 BC, who is the current Gentile ruling empire of the land? Who do you think that they would say? Would they say that Greece is the, the one in charge right now or is it the Romans? Of course it's the Romans. And with that, is that then if you asked them, well, who is the fourth empire of Daniel 2 and 7? They would say Rome. And that is why they would also say that the 70 weeks prophecy has not been fulfilled. But they actually would give you a really good estimation of when they expected it to be completed. In chapter 1 of the Damascus document, it says the following. For because of their tre tre uh, treason that they forsook him, he, God, hid his face from Israel and from his sanctuary and delivered them unto the sword. But when he remembered the covenant of the forefathers, he left a remnant to Israel and gave them not over to unto extermination. This is clearly talking about the exiling of, uh, of a remnant group uh, to Babylon at the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Continuing on. And at the end of 390 years, after he had delivered them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. So you can see the chronological marker here of 390 years after the destruction of Jerusalem with the Qumran writer saying that after this, after 390 years, that there arose the man of scoffing who dropped to Israel waters of deceitfulness. This is referring to Antiochus Epiphanes as the rest of chapter one of the Damascus document is all about him and Israel's apostasy. So the Qumran chronology has 390 years between Nebuchadnezzar and Antiochus. They're getting this number from Ezekiel's prophecy where God told Ezekiel to lay on one side for 390 days and the other side for 40 days and each day signified a year. And they took the 390 and slapped it on. Now, since Antiochus' persecution began in 170 BC with the death of Ananias, the priest, the Qumran chronology has the temple being destroyed in 560 BC. Yes, this doesn't match our modern chronology, but we've seen that many times in the ancient world that, you know, they got different dates for all these events. But this is pretty close within the ballpark of 587, 586 BC that we use today. 
This is backed up by Roger Beckwith when he compared various ancient chronologies and their ex expectation of the Messiah's arrival. So, what this does is give us a 490 BC date for the return from exile, which according to the Qumran community said was the start of the 70 weeks prophecy, thus expecting the Messiah's arrival around 3 to 1 BC when you use the 364 calendar, or in about two jubilee periods from the time of 11Q Melchizedek was written, which is why the community is seen as an apocalyptic one. Most of their materials is our materials are always geared uh, to this, and you know, and basically saying, hey, look, we need to stay faithful to the law. Uh, because God's deliverance is coming soon and he's going to, you know, uh, judge the sons of darkness and Belial and all his evil following spirits. And this type of use of the 70 weeks shows us why messianic expectation was so high during the time of Jesus. For the Qumran community, they saw the 70 weeks as messianic and were expecting the divine Messiah to arrive in the next hundred years. The other thing that it tells us is that the Essenes, who, according to the late daters, had a finalized first edition of Daniel in their hands, did not put the final fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies with Antiochus Epiphanes, but into the future. So, according to late daters, this would have to be their line of thinking, is that the Essenes missed that memo when they received their post-eventum prophecy book. So, late daters, just think about this for a little bit. Are you really going to say that this entire community living at the very time and location in which you assign the composition date to was fooled at when the book was composed and mistaken at how to interpret all of the prophecies? Reminder, hit the subscribe button below, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, and leave a comment. And don't forget to visit us at justscripture.org. And in the meantime, stay salty.